today is that Dominic Fiorenza is going to speak about twisted cohomology and the level conversation of the 60 W3W. Right, the 60 of this. Yeah, right. Um, we'll come back to that. But before starting, let me thank Isham both for the invitation and for organizing this really pleasant meeting. And <coughs> so, in the previous talks by Isham, Urs, and Vincent, we already had a general description of what the broad picture of this cohomotopy and twisted cohomotopy in M theory is. So in this talk, I'll try to zoom in a particular aspect just to show how the mathematics work. So it will be just a little specific example. It will be this uh, best Zumino term for the five brain. It has been originally introduced by Kevin in Trilligator in um, other way. So in <coughs> this paper, so it's now about Oh, there's no date here, so it, it's from the beginning of the <coughs> of the century, it's uh, around year 2000, I guess. So what Kevin does, uh, Kenneth, sorry, Kenneth Intrigator does is to introduce an action for the five brain, which is strongly resemblant the whited formula for the off invariant. So the fields here are the usual G4 and G7, so G4 is the C field strength, so it's the curvature of this three connection. Uh, G7 will be the Hodge dual of G4, and then we will have a worksheet uh, sigma 6, which will be six dimensional, and it will have uh, a map to the space time. Space time which will be usually 11 dimensional, and I will write it as a product. It will be some x8, some spin 8 manifold, times a uh, Minkowski space here. And <coughs> And then uh, this H3 that appears here in the action is some other field. Uh, I, I will discuss it later, but you already know from the previous talk what is that. That will be a trivialization of G4. And, and then the action is defined this way. So we take some bounding seven manifold, and we will discuss when this exists. And uh, you pick extensions of both fields. So you have an F hat which extends F and an H3 hat that extends H3. And then you get this 7, 4 over uh, sigma 7 and you, you take the integral. So uh, the real problem here is clear what this is. Uh, the, on the left hand side, I just have F and H3. While on the right hand side, I am playing with their extension, F hat and H3 hat. So the question is, is the right hand side well defined? Does it depend on the extension or not? So what we need to give are conditions in order for the right-hand side to be independent of the extensions, at least modulo the integers, so that at least the exponential of the action is well-defined. So there is a very simple solution, which consists in saying that my datum G4 here is not just an arbitrary four form, but it is inherited by S4 via a map from X8 uh, to S4. Well, above X8, of course, there's X8 times R12 with the projection, so I can still pull back that. But the re relevant information is this eight dimensional information here. And why does this solve the problem? Well, uh, I said that the intrigator action is a variant of whited formula. And if we make, we make this assumption, which actually is one of the assumptions that Intrigator made in his uh, paper to make an example of uh, anomaly cancellation condition, well, the action r really becomes back the whitehead formula. Whitehead formula computes a discrete invariant. This discrete invariant takes values that are well-defined mod root z, and so we are done. So from the <coughs> M-theory perspective, we can say that this assumption here, so the assumption that everything is determined by a single map to S4, is an instance of cohomotopy. So we could say that the C field is taking its charge, so its curvature, is taking values into degree four cohomotopy. And so this solves the issue of the well-definedness of S, but it has other issues. So at least, uh, other way. So at least 
What I'm said is that from an M theory perspective, uh, this assumption of just mapping to S4 is uh, too a strict assumption. Um, a, a problem that arises is that this way, so this form here is, so this form here is G4 is already an integral form, but it, it should not be G4 to be integral, but it should be this shift form, G4 plus one fourth of the first Pontryagin class of X to be integral. And now one half of the first Pontryagin class on a spin manifold is integral, but it, it is generally not div divisible by two. So this form will generally only be half integral if G4 is already integral. So this means that just mapping to S4 is not the right setup. Either we make strong assumptions on X8, so on our space time, in order that its first Pontryagin class is divisible by four, or we have to change the target. And a consistent way of changing the target in order to get this, to this integrality condition to be always satisfied is to map not to S4, but to some quotient of S4. Some S4 modeled out by some Lie group acting on S4. And, but now we are no more assumed that the interligator action is well defined. So the interplay is finding a correct quotient here in order that we get this integrality here and at the same time we save the well-definedness of the action. And we are going to show how a suitable G that will be just sp2 solves both this problem at once. So now that we have introduced the setup, I can give the detailed definition of the fields that are occurring in this construction. So we will have some eight dimensional smooth spin eight manifold, one spin eight connection. This will be one of the background fields in the construction. And then we have this pair G4, G7. I'm taking them independently. So I'm not assuming that G4 is the Hodge dual of uh, uh, that G7 is the dual of G4? Well, two reasons. O of course, if I'm restricting my attention to the eight manifold, this makes no sense dimensionally. So this can be the dual of this only on X times uh, three manifold. And also because uh, as it was uh, <coughs> already said in the previous talks, we want here to emphasize the cohomological content of the theory before imposing the dyna dyna dynamical equations. And the constraint that G4 and G7 and delta has to obey, so this equation here involves uh, th the three fields and not just the two, is that, well, G4 is closed, and then the differential is G7 is this one half G4, G4, as it was in the non-twisted case, but then there is this correction. There's the square of one fourth of the first Pontryagin class of the curvature form. So here we are working at the level of differential forms, not of classes. And okay, it is convenient to introduce the shift I was mentioning before already at this level. So I introduced this G4 int, int stays for integral, which is that the shifted form. So as in the RAM cohomology, P1 of NABLA is a closed form. G4 int is still closed, so the first equation is basically unchanged. The first equation is basically unchanged, and the second equation here is just shifted, so it takes this form. While do we introduce this expression uh, once the equation is just the same, just rewritten? Well, the reason is that this way we can impose an integrality constraint. So this red one is an additional equation that we impose in addition to these other two. So we have these two and the integrality constraint. And, and then we have our six dimensional worksheet. It has a map F to X8. And then we have a tree form on the worksheet. Uh, which trivializes the pullback of the integral G4. So the differential of H3 
uh, is precisely f star of this. And with these ingredients, we can define an action. And we first define the action locally. So we are <coughs> in this situation. So we have our sigma 6. This is mapping to our big x8. But we assume that it actually takes values just one open chart u. So this is the local situation. And the local situation is easy to handle since u there is just contractible. It has no cohomology. And this means that I can find potentials both for this closed form and for this expression here that turns out due to the previous equation to be another closed form. And in terms of this potential, we can define a six dimensional action, which is the, just this integral expression here. What we have to show is that this expression now does not depend on the choice of C3 on, and C6. So it is independent of the choice of the potentials. And this is just an easy exercise. What is difficult is not doing this, ex this exercise, but going from the local picture, so just having sigma mapping into a chart, to a global picture. So the problem is, how do we globalize this action here? And to see how to do this, let me start with a very simple example. So we go down from dimension 6 to dimension 1. So my manifold sigma 6 just became a, a copy of S1. And my target will be a manifold X endowed with just a two form. And this two form, I will require it just to be a closed form. So in the local picture, I can do just the same that I did before. This form omega 2 is closed, so it will have a potential. So there will exist some C1 whose differential is omega 2. And we can define an action for just the field F. So here, everything is simplified. This, in this toy model, this is just F. There is not, no H3. The action of F is just the integral of, over S1 of the pullback of the potential C1. And again, this is well defined. It does not depend on the choice of C1. But this <coughs> we can easily globalize this way. We add an integrality condition. So we add the assumption that the closed two form omega 2 is not just closed, so it not just represents an element in um, H2 with coefficients in R, but it is actually an integral form. So it represents an element in H2 with coefficients in Z. And then we can do the following. Assume that X is simply connected. So we make an assumption, or a topological assumption on X. We will get rid of this in a minute. And then there exists at least an extension F hat of my field F from just S1 to the disk D2. And then we can pull back the two form, which is our datum on X, to the wall of D2 and take the integral over D2. And this is well defined, at least modulo the integers. Uh, why it is so? Well, because if we have two different extensions, then we can glue them together. And now we have a map from a closed two manifold to X. So the difference of the actions with the two extensions is just the integral over sigma 2 of the pullback of an integral form. So this will be an integer. So it will be the pairing between the fundamental class of this closed two manifold with an integral form. And this will be an integer. So <coughs> the first problem we want to face is, do we really need this target manifold x to be simply connected? Or there is a way of presenting this construction in, a way, uh, is in such a way that we get rid of any topological assumption on the space-time. Well, the, um, the assumption that x is uh, simply connected can actually be relaxed. And oh, let me just touch it so that it does not disappear. And the idea is that we assume that our field omega, our two form on x, is not 
uh, native in a sense on X, but it is pulled back, is inherited by another space Y. And it will be Y that we will require to be simply connected. So the situation we have is the following. We take an, a closed form on Y, which is an integral form on Y, and we pull it back to X. And now the extension problem for F that goes from S1 to X needs not to be solved with another map to X. We, or, uh, we only need to solve it for a map to Y. So we don't need to have a triangle here S1, D2, D2 going to X, but D2 can go to Y. Then we define the action just the same way, and just the same proof we had before shows that this is well defined. And this extends the, the local picture. So in the case uh, my map goes into an open chart U, this action here that we have written just reproduces the integral of the pullback of C1. So, which Y can we choose? So, the requirements Y has to have is that Y has a map to, say, the shift of closed two form. So, we have the datum of a closed two form on Y. And this closed two form represents a real cohomology class, which is actually um, an integral cohomology class. And so there is an universal such Y. So there is a universal space, it's actually a stack, that comes with a map to close to form representing integral forms. And so what is a, st um, what, what is a space that carries both universally a, an integral two form represented by a close to form? Well, <coughs> as KZ2 is the same thing as the classifying space for U1 bundles, and this one carries a universal degree two integral form which is just first general class. I'm looking for a space, in a sense, that carries a closed two form representative of the first general class of line bundle. And this space is just U1 bundle with connections. So the two form here is the curvature form associated to the connection, well, this map here is just a forgetful morphism. But <coughs> let me digress for a minute on this example to convince you that this example here is really universal. So let me show you how <coughs> the stack of U1 bundles with connections really arises from just this part of the diagram. So <coughs> this is what will suggest how to construct more abstract and <coughs> differential refinements uh, how they were introduced in Vincent's talk. So <coughs> the situation we are working with is the following. We have this map here, okay, R2, and here we have K and here we want to make some pullback. And now, well, what is this? This is clear what is. It, this is a, a shift on smooth manifold. To any smooth manifold, uh, we have, um, we, we associate the set of closed two form on that manifold, and this is compatible with pullbacks and restrictions. Here, well, here, this is a space but we are not really interested in maps to that space. Maps to KR2 are not what we actually want. We want something like close to form on X going to H2 of XR. And this is not the space of maps from X to KR2. This is just the pinot of that space. So, there is some difference here. The difference is that here we are just taking the set just as it's given, and here we are modding out homotopy equivalences. So the point is that this should not be looked as a space, but rather as a stack, as a two stack. And this is the two stack 
B to R, which corresponds to the <coughs> chain complex just R zero zero, where this R here is the sheaf of locally constant functions with values on R plus in degree minus two. And here, the same way, I have this B to Z, which is just Z, zero, zero. And these are locally constant functions with values in Z. And now everything is working on the same level. I have a shift here, a shift here. Well, this is a shift of complexes and another shift here. And I have to compare this. So these are two term complexes. So let me make also this um, two term complex so to compare more easily. And the picture will be something like this. So here is our Okay, so now <coughs> this map here is just the inclusion of Z into R, but what is this map here? Well, <coughs> of course there's a map of complexes here, which is just zero goes to R, zero goes to zero, and close form goes to zero. This is a map of complexes, but it, it of course is not the right map, map of complexes there. In this map, every close two form goes to zero. So it does not go to its representative in the RAM cohomology. So this is less naive than expected. And what is the correct solution? Well, <laughs> these locally constant functions with values in R are nothing but closed zero forms. And now, <laughs> well, no, now these two start to look similar. Here I have closed two forms, here I have closed zero forms. And <laughs> I can replace this complex here with a quasi-isomorphic one. We just learned from Christian, where's Christian? Uh, thought that everything we do should not see quasi-isomorphic. So I can replace this with just all zero forms going with the Durham differential to one forms going to closed two forms. And this is a quasi isomorphism of shifts. So <laughs> this completely kills this, and this will kill the closed part of this. So all we remain with is this part, and now the map is the clear one. This is the identity, and these are just zeros. So now we are almost ready to compute the pullback here. Everything has to be homotopy invariant, so we do not want just a pullback, we want a homotopy pullback. And to compute a homotopy pullback, I have to replace either this map here or this map here with a vibration. And the simplest way to replace this map here with a vibration is just to consider something bigger, which is Z inside all zero forms inside one forms, and to remove this part that I do not want. So I just put zero, zero forms, one forms, and I take the total complex of this, this double complex. This is equivalent to this, and now this has a natural map to here, which is a vibration, which is just taking this funny complex here, mapping omega zero to, oh sorry, up here. Omega zero to omega zero, omega one to omega one this is just the identity, and this omega one goes to close two form with the differential. And now we can just compute the pullback. So what's the pullback? Is the part of this big total complex that has here zero, here zero, and here no condition, since this just have to go to a close two form, and every one form goes to some close one uh, two form. So here we get just z going to omega zero, going to omega one. And this is just the, the, the two-term delin complex 
that presents the, the stack of uh, U1 bundles with connections. So this is the idea how starting with this picture, this picture is the one that both Isham and Vincent were presenting. Uh, we have forms, representative, sort of DRAM cohomology, integral cohomology, gives uh, a construction of a differential refinement. This is something that can be actually done explicitly. So this constructs the differential models of spaces. And, but after this digression, let us go back to the actual talk. Uh, so, <coughs> so, okay. So uh, our why now is the stack of BU1 bundles with connection. Everything is unchanged. And we see that what matters, the real field content, is just a map from S1 to BU1 con. So the real field content is just a U1 connection on S1. And with this field content, my extension problem becomes the following. So this goes to here. Now this is simply connected as every one bundle U1 bundle with connection on S1 can be extended to a one bundle with connection over the world disk. So the extension problem is solved and uh, we can define this action as the integral of the curvature of this uh, extended connection. And since we have this commutative di diagram here, we start with a connection on D2, we restrict it to the boundary and take the holonomy of this. This is the same as taking the curvature and integrating the curvature. So the, the action that we had previously defined in terms of the extension to the disk is nothing but the holonomy of the unique original field that is the map to BU1 con. So, okay, back to S4. So first problem in globalizing was the fact that I have to find a bounding seven manifold. So for the toy example, we are just S1 and S1 is bounded by the disk. And in the six dimensional example, we had uh, just a uh, sigma six. And the first problem in order to extend the fields is uh, to extend this to a seven manifold bounding it. Can this be done? Yes, it can because the six dimensional oriented cobordings group is trivial. So every compact oriented six manifold is the boundary of some seven dimensional six manifold. Uh, then we still have the problem of extending F and H3, but as we have seen in the toy example, that is not really a problem. So that's an apparent problem. Uh, it, it is a problem if we fix the space time X, but once we replace X to the with its universal substitute that the fields lives on, this problem disappears. So, <coughs> so now the action is this one. So we just take extension to sigma seven of F and H3, and we write this action here. So when X is just a local chart, this coincides, it's just Stokes theorem, coincides with the action which was defined in terms of C3 and C6 over sigma six. And, and now as in the toy model, the problem is how do we globalize this picture? And what we have learned from the toy example is that we have to extend this map F together with now the datum of H3 to some homotopy commutative diagram in such a way that our form, this form here, which is a form on sigma seven, is integral. And a way of ensuring that this is integral is that this is a pullback of something coming from some space, E7. So <coughs> now to construct this, I, I need a quick digression, digression of on Sullivan models that luckily for me, <coughs> uh, Vincent has already done. So, <coughs> The, the starting point is that to give a map between smooth manifolds is exactly the same thing, is nothing more, nothing less, than giving its pullback map between their DRAM algebras. 
So <coughs> it's uh, an easy an easy exercise, it sometimes is called the Milner exercise in textbooks, that any morphism of commuter differential graded algebras between two Deram algebras is the pullback for some um, smooth map. Actually, the idea is, is very simple. Uh, a, a map like this preserves the degree, so maps the C infinity function on Y to the C infinity function on X, and already this freezes phi to be the pullback of some, uh, some f. So <coughs> the idea is that this algebra, the real algebra, contains all the geometrical information. So we can think that this algebra up to homotopy contains all the homotopical information on x. And this is almost true since this lives in a world of characteristic zero in taking this object up to a mode where we are losing the torsion phenomena. But that's the only thing we lose. So <coughs> the idea is that this way we have moved from smooth manifolds to commuter differential graded commutative algebras, but now we can use all of commuter differential graded algebras. And if we take such an algebra A, then we can define a functor from manifolds to sets, which is just the morphism of differential graded commutative algebras from A to the Deram algebra of X. And the nice thing about this functor is that this functor is a shift. It is a smooth shift. The idea is that if we cover X with open sets UY, and we gave morphisms of differential graded commutative algebras from A to this Deram algebras of um, the open sets UI in a compatible way, this glue together to give a single morphism from A to the Deram algebra of X. So essentially, I'm just saying, uh, that, but this will be clear in this example, that a map from A to here is just a way of selecting differential forms on X that obey the relation coming from A and if I do this locally, I'm giving a set of differential forms on every open path of X. All these forms obey the same relations, so they glue together into, a global, into global forms obeying those relations. And here's a very simple example. So I take this algebra, an algebra with a single generator in degree n plus 1 with trivial differential, and then the shift phi A is just closed n plus 1 forms. So that example there, omega 2 closed, is an example, an instance of this construction here. Uh, <coughs> more general examples are <coughs> uh, for any at least connected and simply connected manifold, we can uh, build a minimal model for this algebra, which is an algebra which is just a polynomial algebra with a differential which is quadratic in the um, generators. And examples of these are S4 and S7. They have these two models that we have already seen in previous talks. And in terms of these two models here, what is very simple to give is the quaternionic Hopf vibration. So S7 goes over S4, and in the dual picture forms on S4 pull back to form on S7, and in terms of the Sullivan model, this is just this algebra with two generators going to this algebra with one generator in the most obvious way. Omega 4 goes to 0, here there is not nothing in degree 4, and omega 7 goes to omega 7. And more generally, we can do this also uh, with an action of some Lie group G that uh, makes the quaternionic of vibration equivalent. We have learned from uh, Urs talk that there is a maximal uh, Lie group with this property that is sp1 dot uh, sp2 and in this talk I will focus on the sp2 factor. That will be enough for what I have to present. So <coughs> I have, since the op vibration is sp2 equivariant, I can mod out sp2 and I still have a vibration here. This will be still an S3 vibration, and we can present a model for it in terms of Sullivan algebra, so an algebraic model. So you see uh, the new generator 
P1 corresponding to the first Poincarin class has appeared, and also a new generator chi8 corresponding to the Euler characteristics appears. So the equation we get is almost the very equation we wanted, but it has this additional term chi8. So <coughs> in order to get back to our picture, we want to get rid of, of this. So, <coughs> so what do we just add a new generator, theta7, that kills chi8. So <coughs> the, the real space we are working with will not be S4 mod mod SP2, but it will be this pullback. So we are universally uh, erasing the class K8. Uh, from the point of view of space time, uh, this can either be seen as a restrictive assumption. This is the assumption that the uh, Euler characteristic of my eight manifold is zero, or it can be seen as um, uh, uh, an easy to satisfy assumption, since by removing points from my x8, I can change its Euler characteristic, making it to be zero. So up to adding field sources, I'm told uh, they are called, I, I can change the topology of x in order to have this uh, condition always satisfied. Okay, so now what happens? Now, a map from this E4 to my spacetime x is the content of forms G4, G7, and theta7. So I have this additional form theta7 here, which trivializes chi8. And <coughs> my equations that were this one tell me that omega4 goes to something close, and that omega-7 goes to something satisfying this equation. And now I have to be careful in giving this map here. So this map is not as obvious as it may uh, be thought of. So omega-4 goes to G4, but omega-7 does not go to G7. It goes to a shifted copy of G7. And when we do this, what happens is that now this expression here, which is just the resolution of this map here in the composition of a weak equivalence here followed by a co-fibration, make this seven term here appear. This term is closed. So it will always be mapped to a closed seven form. And due to this particular assignment here, that has this shift here, the seven form we get is this one. So we have this part here that came from this part, but then we have this correction, theta seven. And taking care of both two, we have this term here that gets cancelled by this. So <coughs> this action, which is actually the original intelligator action, is really always a closed seven form. So it will always give a homotopy invariant. So this ensures at least that my construction is well defined at a real cohomology level. And now it comes the last part. How can I prove that this always represents an integral form? So the problem is working with Sullivan models, I can easily produce closed form, so I can easily produce the RAM classes. But since everything is working in uh, algebras over the reals, there is no control at this level of their integrality properties. So we need some extra information. And the extra information is that the quaternionic of vibration, as we said, is still an S3 vibration. And as every sphere vibration, it, cames, it comes with its uh, Giesian sequence. And Giesian sequence is something very nice. It tells me that, so let me, 
skip this. So Kissing sequence tells me the following, that the fiber integration map uh, fits into a sequence where the next term is the multiplication by the Euler class. This means that <coughs> we can identify something that is killed by fiber integration just by checking, uh, sorry, something that is in the image of fiber integration, just by checking its cap product with the Euler class. So since the equation we add for the integral G4 class, remember it was the shift copy of omega 4, it was omega 4 minus 1 fourth of P1, <coughs> uh, tells me that this expression here is closed. This means that the, this class is zero in cohomology. And everything here is integral. Notice this is integral by our assumption. This is one half of the first point Lagrange class. So this is integral two. So this is an integral class, which is zero in integral cohomology. And this is precisely the cap product of gamma for int with this integral class here. And this integral class is nothing but the Euler class of the equivariant of vibration. So the Giesen sequence tells me that gamma for int is in the kernel of this map. So it is in the image of fiber integration. So there exists some class here, so some integral class that goes to gamma for int when it is integrated over the fiber. Okay, so this is a, a first equation I have with here something integral. So what is now the idea? The idea is The idea is my Sullivan model actually produces another class now in real cohomology, which has the same integral. So the difference between the two will be in the kernel of the integration. So this is what happens next. And <coughs> so what I have to do is to identify at the level of Sullivan models my fiber integration. So in the model for E7, so in the model for this copy of S7 modeled out by uh, SP2, uh, we had this additional generator H3. This was the, the field H3 that has already appeared. And this degree three generator is cohomologically interpreted as the vertical volume form. So the integration of S3 is precisely removing this H3. So more precisely, H3 is an odd expression. So if we write polynomials here as polynomials in all variables with an additional variable H3, so this algebra here as a polynomial algebra is the polynomial algebra in H3 with coefficients the polynomial algebra in all the other generators. Since H3 is odd, um, only two kinds of polynomial we have. Either we do not have the H3 generator or we have it just once. So all expressions here have necessarily this form here and integration over S3 just removes H3. So maps alpha plus H3 which beta just to beta. And if we apply this transformation to gamma seven, that was a shortened name for my cocycle, for my closed expression here, well, you see that here omega seven, omega mm, theta seven, and these are the alphas. These are expressions in the other generators, so they are killed by integration. And here I have my H3 wedge something, and this goes just to something. And this something here is precisely my shift class. So <coughs> what?
OK. So, <coughs> so we take our element gamma 7. This goes to some class here that integrates to gamma 4 int. And at the Sullivan model level, it goes to omega 4 plus 1 for p1, which is just what I just showed. And via these isomorphisms, this give goes to gamma 4 int. So we have two classes that goes here. My integral class, 2s tilde, and my real class, gamma 7 plus uh, h3 wedge gamma 4 int plus theta 7. So all this is in the kernel of the map from h7 to h4 given by fiber integration over h3. But Gissin sequence tells me what is this kernel. This kernel is just the image of pullback uh, from the base. So this is just the image of the pullback from E4 to E7. So this tells me that this difference class is pi star of beta with beta living in H7 of E4. But now a uh, direct cohomological computation shows that uh, H7 of A4 with real coefficients is zero. So this class here is zero in real cohomology. And this means that these two actually differ by a torsion class. And some other more uh, subtle computation shows that not only this is zero, but uh, the integral h7 is 0. So actually, this is an identity. And so this one here on the right, which is um, a priori a real cohomology class, which is the class we constructed out of Sullivan models, equals some unknown integral class. But we don't care about the fact that this is unknown. Since these two are equal, what we are really saying is that this expression here always represents an integral class. And this solves the problem of having a well-defined action. So, thanks a lot.